bit of enlightenment that I received this morning. Um, you all see these three lights up here? If you go back to the, the light panel board back there, those are called shadow lights. Now, this auditorium was expanded almost 50 years ago. Those lights were put in then. And for 50 years, I always assumed that they were called shadow lights because the platform lights back here will tend to cast a shadow across our faces up here on the platform, and those will eliminate that shadow. Of course, now that I think about it, that shadow probably is a good thing. But <laughs> nonetheless, I discovered this morning that's not why they're called shadow lights. They're called shadow lights because they cause this pulpit microphone to cast a shadow across anything on the pulpit. Not only that, but they are so ingeniously positioned that they will cast a shadow over the important words. You're not going to find an and or a the under the shadow. But come to a word like God bears the shadow, OK? So as we start to sing this, um, I'm trying to mitigate that by actually wearing my glasses this time. I don't know how much that'll do. But as we start to sing this, if you hear me sing, my country tis of the sweet and lovely, that's because the shadow is right across that word, OK? <laughs> so um, I'll do my best. Uh, let's, if you'll stand with me. Um, hope you have page 781 at this point. Let's sing all four verses of My Country Tis of Thee. <clears throat> My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. My native country, the land of the noble free, thy name I love. I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and templed hills, my heart with rapture thrills like that above. Let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees, sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that breathe partake, let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. Our fathers, God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. Thank you. You may be seated. I think that's okay. Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the privilege and opportunity to be in your house once again tonight. We're thankful for this country that we live in and the freedoms that we enjoy because of your sovereignty. We ask now you'll be with our pastor, continue to heal him, help him to get the rest that he needs. We're thankful that you protected him over uh, through this accident. We know that uh, all things are known of you, and we're thankful for your watch care there. Be with others uh, that have special needs. We think of Sandy. She's recovering from surgery. Uh, George and John Manganero from their uh, surgeries. Uh, we ask especially that you'll be with uh, Kay and her mom and their family with the home going of her sister. We ask, Lord, that you'll provide comfort in a way that only you can. And we'll thank you. We appreciate all that you've done for us. We, we are un, uh, ungrateful sometimes, Lord. But help us to never take these things for granted. Help us to be a thankful and a grateful people. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your hymn books once again and turn to hymn number 817, I Need Jesus. Uh, we will sing verses 1 and 2 of this hymn. Um, number 817, verses 1 and 2. I need Jesus. 
Jesus, my need I now confess, no friend like him in times of deep distress. I need Jesus, the need I gladly own, though some may bear their load alone, yet I need Jesus. Thank you very much. Um, John, you have our special music tonight, right? appreciate that. Hopefully my mic is on. Obviously doing things a little out of order. I'm going to not get in trouble. We were going to do the memory verse. We will do that. But just a couple more quick announcements. I mentioned in the prayer, continue to pray for Kay and her family with the homegoing, homegoing of her sister, uh, Jen. Pray for them. Uh, continue to pray for those recovering from hip surgery. Think of Sandy uh, with her hip surgery, uh, George and John with their respective surgeries. So pray for them. 
Pastor said that he got some much needed sleep this afternoon, which is a good thing. Uh, rest and just taking it easy is what uh, the doctor ordered. Uh, he was able to get some rest. He said to pass on to everybody how much they appreciate the love and the concern and the prayers. And uh, once again, we're just thankful that uh, the Lord spared him. Um, my son-in-law sent me a, a, a link this morning, uh, 12.30 a.m. this morning, there was a fatality right down the street from us, right there at Joe's Butcher Shop. Um, so you just, you just never know. So we're thankful for God's protection there. Again, they'll be out this week. They're going to be in the area, but he'll be, he'll be off this week. If you need anything, give me or one of the other deacons or one of the trustees a call. Uh, we'd be happy to take care of anything you need. So remember to pray for them. Also, the other announcements are in your bulletin. Uh, the uh, virtual VBS coming up. I don't think many, if any, have signed up yet, but you know how that goes. Um, I know they're going to be having a meeting shortly with that. So continue to pray for that. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll see even more kids than you would in person. It's not the same, but the Lord can use this. And again, I'm really thankful for the technology. Um, we've been praying on Saturdays for some of the missionaries that um, not only are they affected by the virus and, and in some cases uh, unrest and all that, a lot of them don't even have the ability to live stream and to see. So there's folks around the world right now that haven't had church for months. And so what a sad thing. So while we might be inconvenienced a little bit, to be sure, let's just remember how thankful we should be and in, uh, in all that we have for this country. Now that you mention it, I do see the shadow now. So um, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles for the, the memory verse. I'll step out on a limb. I, I, I appreciate it's in the bulletin, but I like picking up our Bibles to find the references. Um, to each his own. If you like it in the bulletin, it's nice and handy. But you know what we found when we were doing Awana? We found that kids didn't know where to find stuff in the Bible. They just didn't. And we were shocked. And we're like, well, it's right. And I'm thinking, we don't teach them this anymore. That's why every now and then we do the sword drills. Right? And, and my, my daughter Amanda, she, I don't even try to keep up with her. But I got to thinking, why are we doing these verses? Well, it's, it's to memorize them, of course. But it's to know where to go. Now, I'm going to confess. I have an old uh, Schofield Bible, and I've had it for probably 30 years. So having read through it, I kind of know where certain things are. Oh, that verse, and then I, I remember what it looks like on that page, etc. But I think it's good that every now and then we just we pick up the Bible to do the verse. So I would encourage you to do that. The memory verse for this month is very appropriate. I almost preached on it this morning. in 2 Chronicles 7.14. So I will pause for just a moment so you can find it. 2 Chronicles 7.14. Many of you might already know the verse. Um, we definitely should know the principles of the verse. Um, but I'll give you just a second. Uh, to find that, Second Chronicles 7.14. All right, as we normally do, we'll say the reference, we'll say the verse, we'll say the reference, we'll do that twice. So Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their, heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Appreciate that verse. Um, that is the Old Testament, of course. People say, oh, the Old Testament is, is outdated. I don't think we could have a more appropriate verse and a timely verse for what's going on in this country, in this world. Um, I can tell you, I said this morning, I think we're very spoiled in this country. We think, oh, that's never going to happen here. I'm going to be honest. I've seen things happen in the last few months that in my 56 years, I would have never imagined were going to happen. Just would have never thought it. And sometimes we have to be very careful because we get the idea that it will never happen. Oh, that's never going to change. Uh, things of the last few weeks have just boggled my mind at what's going on. And, and as I mentioned this morning, and I'll make no apology for it and I'll stand by it, all of this is a sin problem. Now, let me be clear. I am not saying anything against those that legally, lawfully protest. It's a constitutional right. 
I defended it for 24 years, and to be frank, that's how the country started, was protesting. Obviously, it came to arms because of uh, Great Britain and everything else, but let's be honest. We have to be able to, to, to have freedom of speech. We stand for that. We stand for freedom of religion. And what I've uh, observed over the last few months, to be honest, is an erosion of these things, an erosion of the fundamentals, an erosion of the foundations. I mentioned it a little bit this morning. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I think I've preached this before. It's been a few years, but I thought it was very timely, and it was what the Lord laid on my heart. If you'll turn to Psalm 11, Psalm 11 uh, this evening, uh, I want to talk a little bit more, and it's going to kind of dovetail with this morning's message a little bit. There'll be a little bit of, not overlap, but it'll tie in, I hope. Um, but we're in some, we're, we're in some, some uncertain times. I mean, I know that uh, Dawn's grandparents went through the Great Depression, and I know that there's been, but these are some really uncertain times. And so we need to Hold fast to truth. I hear pastor, every time he's up here preaching, I hear him at least a few times in a message, you hear him talk about truth, right? And that's what, it, that's what we have to, have to rely on. In uncertain times, in uncertain things, what do we do? Gravitate, go to what you know to be true, the unchanging things. And of course, that for us is the word of God. But in Psalm 11, I'm gonna read the whole Psalm, but we're gonna key in on one verse that says, in the Lord... I put my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to, the mount, to your mountain. Scholars aren't sure the exact context of this, but, uh, the background of this psalm, but many believe, some believe that David is being given advice to flee. They're not really sure if it was when Saul was, was ready to, to go after him or whether it was his uh, situation with Absalom. But he's saying, in the Lord put I my trust. In other words, how can I flee how can I run away if in the Lord put I my trust? Is that what we're trusting in? Listen, we need uh, to take the precautions, obviously a vaccine and all these other things. But with everything going on, our, it reminds me even more, we should be trusting the Lord because he knows the things, the beginning from the ending. And while we elect politicians, we can't put all of our trust in them. Now, they are ordained or have ordained of God, and I believe personally sometimes we get what we deserve, right? But let's be honest, America has turned their back on God for the most part, and it happened quite a long time ago. He goes on to say, For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string. In other words, they're ready to strike, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. You look at everything going on. And of course, we're, we're not going to be political. That's not the point of preaching God's word. But it, acts, but it applies to the, to the events of the day. Listen, it's no mistake people were ready to pounce when these things happened. Here's the verse I want to key in on. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. See, that hasn't changed. Doesn't matter about COVID. Doesn't matter about... Anything else going on, God's still in control. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that once again we can be in your house. We're thankful for those that are out this evening. We're thankful for those that are able to live stream and to see your word proclaimed. I pray that as unworthy as we are, that you'll use me this evening. Help me to say precisely what you'd have me to say from your word and not say the things that you would not want said. But Lord, help us to understand that your word commands us to, to, be, to be vigilant, that your word commands us to stand by truth. And we're thankful for those men and women years gone by that have stood by your word. Those founders of this country, while of course imperfect, uh, were guided, we believe, by you to found this country based on religious liberty and religious freedom and, 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 and for people to be guided by your principles. Lord, we beg that you'll send revival to this country because we know that it's the only hope 
as we look out with everything going on, we know that men and women's hearts need to be changed. And so as we heard about liberty this morning, I pray, Lord, tonight as we look at your foundations, that we will be mindful, and Lord, that we will be diligent and do our part. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Patrick Henry said this, one of the most prominent figures in the American Revolution. He said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's one thing to be a bunch of good people, and it's one thing to be religious people. It's another thing, as we saw this morning, to be spirit-led and to have the liberty and to live under that liberty. I mentioned this morning all the different countries. Uh, I didn't mention the countries, but different places I've been. Listen, I would challenge folks that aren't happy with things here, peacefully protest. Do exercise your constitutional right, but look at other places in the world, and we'll see how good we have it. Do things need to change? Absolutely. Because you know what? No one's perfect. And we wouldn't begin to stand up here and to say that that sinful man doesn't need to be held to account and that things don't need to be done decently and in order. But listen, America was founded on Christian principles. America was founded on that liberty we talked about this morning. And what I fear, what I see, is all of these things are being rewritten in the history books. All of these things are being taken down. Listen, I'm not a fan of of some things, but you know what? If we take down the history, what do we have to look back to? I'll give you a, a perfect example. I saw in Delaware, where I don't, I think it might have been Wilmington or somewhere, where they took down a, a, a I don't know if monuments the right word, a, 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 maybe a monument, and it was it was a slave whipping post. And I was shocked that there was even any of them around. And, and, you know, we get so caught up in the emotion. And I know people will look at it differently. But here's my thing. Let's look at these landmarks. Let's look at the Bible talks about don't remove the landmark. Right. Let's look at these things and remember that should never happen again. That should never be how one person treats another, whether we physically do it or whether we have it in our heart. Remember, Christ said this. He said that if you hate your brother in your heart, you've committed murder. Everyone in this room, I believe, has never committed murder, physical murder, right? But I guarantee you, every one of us, because we're sinful people, have had hate in our heart at one point or another. So it's a heart problem. I spoke about it this morning. We should look at these things and say, it's a sin problem. We should look, and listen, if people say it should come down, I'm not going to argue with something like that. My initial response was, man, we should take young people to that and we should say, there's an ancient landmark of what should never be allowed to happen. Let me read for you real quick. I, I, wanted, I touched on it this morning. If you have already seen it, bear with me. If you haven't, I would challenge you to go and see this, this commentary by Red Skelton. He says, when I was a small boy in Vincennes, Indiana, I heard, I think, one of the most outstanding speeches I ever heard in my life. He actually had heard this, and he related to, to students. He said, we had just finished reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, he says that he thinks this compares with the, with the Gettysburg Address, Socrates' speech, and other things. I don't know about that, but listen, one of the reasons that our foundations are being destroyed and removed is because we haven't taught people. We haven't educated people, both civically and biblically. Some of the things that I hear being taught in, in school systems boggles my mind. I, I just, and that's one of those things where I sit back and I say, are you serious? I can't believe that's happening in this country. And yet it is. He goes on to say this. We had just finished reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, and he, Mr. Laswell, the principal of Vincent's High School, called us all together. And he says, uh, boys and girls, I've been listening to you recite the Pledge of Allegiance all semester, and it seems that it has become monotonous to you. Or could it be you do not understand the meaning of each word? If I may, I would like to recite the pledge and give you a definition of each word. And he goes on to say this. I, me, an individual, a committee of one, pledge, dedicate all my worldly good to give without self-pity, allegiance, my love and my devotion to the flag, 
our standard, old glory, a symbol of courage. And wherever she waves, there is respect because your loyalty has given her a dignity that shouts freedom is everybody's job. If you remember one Veterans Day message I gave, I read the thing about the flag. It's very enlightening to see all the places that that flag has been in battles that have secured people's liberty and freedom. Of the united, that means we have all come together. States, individual communities that have united uh, into 48 states, 48 individual communities with pride and dignity and purpose, all divided by imaginary boundaries, yet united to a common cause, and that's love of country. We don't see that taught. We don't see love of country, of America. And to the republic, a republic, a sovereign state in which power is invested into the representative chosen by the people to govern. And the government is the people. And it's from the people to the leaders, not from the leaders to the people. For which it stands. One nation, meaning so blessed by God. Indivisible, incapable of being divided. But we see that going on now. If we don't know the past, if we don't know the foundations and the legacy, it's going to be easy to divide. With liberty, I mentioned this this morning, which is freedom. The right of power for one to live his own life without fears, threats, or any sort of retaliation. And justice. The principle and qualities of dealing fairly with others. For all. For all. That means, boys and girls, is as much your country as it is mine. So he goes on to say, now let me hear you recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And he recites it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Since that man was a little boy, two states have been added to our country and two words have been added to the Pledge of Allegiance under God. Wouldn't it be a pity if someone said that is a prayer and that be eliminated from schools too. You know why we have these things going on today? I'm not talking about peaceful protests. I'm talking about destruction of property and lawlessness is because these people, these folks were not taught the fundamentals. They were not taught the biblical fundamentals of respect and authority. And if we don't hold on to these foundations, trust me, in our generation, it could be lost. So as we go on, I, go, I say we're living in very uncertain times. I don't think I need to remind anyone of everything that's going on. We're seeing God-ordained institutions under attack. Listen, Satan is no dummy. He knows how to attack the family, the government. Listen, our government's not perfect, but I challenge people to go to any other country in the world and see if it's better. Our history, the very fabric of our society. How has every great nation fallen? It's not by another conquering it. It's they've fallen from within. And I sit back and I wonder as I've traveled all over the world, what must our enemies be thinking? In this message, we're going to look at some things about these fundamentals or these foundations. We're going to see three things quickly. We're going to see the foundations described. Secondly, we're going to see the foundations destroyed. And then lastly, lastly, we'll see the foundations defended. What is a foundation? It's the basis or groundwork of anything. The moral foundation of both society and religion. We have foundations everywhere. Foundations for buildings. We have foundations uh, in every, everywhere we look. And what is one of the most critical things? We sing a song about what? How firm a foundation. What's the foundation of this country? Things like the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. Do you realize if it hadn't have been for Baptist preachers in Virginia, we probably wouldn't even have the Bill of Rights, and we probably wouldn't have ever had the Constitution uh, ratified because they wanted to secure and make sure that they were vital parts. Listen to the importance of foundations. I don't agree with everything that he has said, but and he just went home to be with the Lord, I believe. Rob, Ravi Zacharias told about doing a lectureship several years ago at an Ohio State University. As he was being driven to the lecture, they passed what was the, quote, new Wexner Art Center. The driver commented, this is a new art building for the university. 
It is a fascinating building designed in the postmodernist view of reality. Zacharias described this fascinating, bu fascinating building. He said, the building has no pattern. Staircases go nowhere. Pillars support nothing. The architect designed the building to reflect the postmodernist view of life. It went nowhere and was mindless and senseless. Zacharias turned to the man and said, uh, did they do the same thing with the foundation? And the man laughed and answered, you can't do that with a foundation. You can get away with that with the infrastructure. You can get away with random thoughts that sound good in defense of a worldview that ultimately doesn't make sense. But once you start tampering with the foundations, you begin to see serious effects. Yet the foundations are in jeopardy. The foundations of our culture do not provide coherent sets of answers anymore. And that was in a newsletter written all the way back in 2008. Here's another one quickly. I found it very interesting. The Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, most earthquake proof. The great architect Frank Lloyd Wright was given the challenge of building the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, one of the most earthquake prone cities in the world. Wright's investigation showed that a solid foundation could be floated on a 60-foot layer of soft mud underlying the hotel, which would provide a shock-absorbing but solid support for the immense building. Shortly after the uh, hotel was completed, it withstood the worst earthquake in 52 years, while lesser buildings fell in ruins about it, around it. We cannot overemphasize the importance of a good foundation. Turn quickly to Luke 6. Luke 6. Very familiar passage, very familiar. Christ himself in Luke 6, verse 47, he says this, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. How many times have we read through the Bible and we know that Christ is, is referred to as the rock? And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against that which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Foundations are critically important. So briefly this evening, let's look at a few. What are these foundations? Ephesians 2, 18 and 20 says, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 13, 10 to 11 goes on to say, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What is the foundation for this country? Religious liberty and the freedoms that our forefathers fought for and defended. What is the foundation of the Christian life? It's nothing other than the Word of God. Hebrews 6 1 shows some foundations. Hebrews 6 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Some of the other uh, foundation, some of the other foundational truths to, to fundamental Christianity is the Trinity, the virgin birth, literal heaven and hell, separation from sin into God. We see all, we, all the time we look around, we see these things coming under attack. There's no literal heaven and hell anymore because if there's a literal, he literal heaven and hell, then that means we have to recognize that there's places that people will go. We have to recognize that there's consequences. These foundations are crucial. I mentioned a minute ago, as fundamental Baptists, we believe the foundation is the word of God. Everything related to faith and practice goes back to and is based upon the word of God. 
You've heard me say many times about the Baptist distinctives. They really could just be called Bible distinctives. And the very first one is B for the Bible. The Bible is our sole authority for faith and practice. So these foundations, whether it's civic or whether it's biblical, I read, I'll not mention the group, but there's an active group where one of their stated purposes is to tear down the patriarchal family. In other words, get rid of dads. I'll say this. I take my hat off to those that have the courage to call sin, sin, and to call what the problems are. And as we look around, how can that be somebody's purpose? But yet it is. The very fabric of our society, the family, wasn't that one of the very first institutions God uh, created or one of the very first things that God instituted was the family. You don't have to take my word on any of these things. Just look around and we can see everything is under attack. So that's the foundations described. And there's many more foundations. But let's, let's be honest, let's be clear that as Christians, our firm foundation should be the word of God. Everything we do, everything we say, how we act, when we leave these doors, as we go out into the community, should be reflective of our belief that we trust and we believe this book. So the foundations are destroyed. In verse 3, it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, let's, let me say this. Once the foundations are destroyed, it's a lot more difficult. We are going to be better served preaching, as our pastor does, truth and holding on to those foundations. First, how are they destroyed? I originally thought slowly and over time. And that's true. But man, now we're seeing some are not so slow. Things are being toppled. Things are being destroyed with no no even reason. People are just doing it to do it. And it's sad, but it, it, it goes at the heart that they, this kind of lawlessness and this kind of unpatriotic attitude has stemmed from this slow, gradual deterioration of these foundations. Let me illustrate. And I think I've given this to you before. How much dynamite do you need to blow up a dam? Well, you say it depends on how big it is, where you put it. I don't know that I've ever seen this movie, but Force 10 from Navarone, there's a scene where the good guys, led by Harrison Ford and Robert Shaw, have to blow up a bridge in Yugoslavia that is vital to the Nazis. When they see it, they realize they don't have enough explosives to do the job. Was the mission over? Not hardly. The men decided to blow up a dam upstream that will unleash a torrent of water that will knock out the bridge. Harrison Ford and Robert Shaw dress up as Nazis, clamber down the steep uh, steps to the bottom of the dam, find the right spot, put the explosives in place, and then turn to leave. The dynamite goes off, makes a huge noise, and yep, nothing happened. Outside the dam, the rest of the good guys hear the explosion. When the dam doesn't disintegrate, the team turns to the demolition expert who lights a pipe and says, I love this one, patience. You've got to have patience. At the same moment, Ford and Shaw notice cracks forming in the foundation of the dam. Then the water begins to spurt through the cracks. They run for their lives, barely making it out before the dam collapses, sending an avalanche of water hurling downstream. When it hits the mighty bridge, the columns sway, then begin to crumble. And finally, the bridge collapses at the very moment the Nazis are crossing with their tanks and jeeps. That, my friends, was the climax of the movie. But it's a lesson in how powerful uh, the cracks in a foundation can be. If you know what you're doing. You don't need an atomic bomb to wreak havoc. A little dynamite in the right place will do the trick. And all it takes is a few cracks well placed at the right moment and the whole thing comes crumbling down. I mentioned earlier that we've seen that throughout the last few decades. What are some of the institutions that have been attacked? Little explosives put in the right place. We had the recent Supreme Court decision legalizing gay marriage. We see cracks in the foundation and water pouring through. The dam will collapse eventually, washing away the traditional definition of marriage altogether. 
The same group that I mentioned earlier, one of their tenets, one of their things that they believe in their mission statement is to promote those types of things, to promote transgender, to promote all of these things that tear down the fundamentals. Where did these cracks start? Where did these cracks start? Quite a few of them have been in my lifetime, but let me give you a few. 1962, the Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black ruled that voluntary prayer in public schools, open, vocal, voluntary prayer was no longer constitutional. There's a crack. In 1963, the Shemp decision set in motion the dismantling of classroom Bible reading. There's another crack. I dare say there's folks in this room that probably went to school where they had the Bible read in their classroom. Of course, I'm not promoting a state religion. But when boys and girls were told, be kind one to another. When they were told about loving one another. In 1973, the Roe v. Wade decision legalized abortion in this country. Without being political, I maintain those lives matter. In 1980, it was ruled that the posting of the Ten Commandments on the walls of our public school classrooms was unconstitutional. There's another crack. In 1982, the courts prohibited the teaching of creation in public schools. But listen to this. You can teach evolution. You can teach the philosophy of Karl Marx. You can read racy novels. You can read humanism. You can read New Age philosophy and everything else. But my dear friend, one thing you may not do, you may not pray, you may not read the Bible, you may not post the Ten Commandments, and you may not teach creationism. Crack after crack after crack. Should we wonder why things are happening the way they are? Secondly, let's see why the foundations are being destroyed. We've become a nation, a society that has the idea that you can't tell me what to do mentality. Everybody does that which is right in his own eyes. I'm going to be honest with you. One of the things that just does not sit well with David Carey, whether it's politics, whether it's doctrine, what it, is hypocrisy. It just doesn't sit well. And you look around and, and there's no rhyme or reason. The hypocrisy is running rampant. It's troubling, but we need to hold on to the foundations. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In verse 4, it says, We can remember the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven above. Thirdly, what foundations are being destroyed? Let's see some examples. The first attack came in the Garden of Eden when Satan said, Yea, hath God said. We've already mentioned some of these other things. My friends, we cannot sit back and not fervently, earnestly, first and foremost, pray for this country. My fear, I'm going to be honest, I'll confess, I'm sure that I don't pray enough. But we have to pray for this country and pray for the leaders and pray for, for other Christians and just pray that God will, will work a revival because that is the only thing that's going to help this country. I mentioned this morning, no amount of legislation is going to change a man's heart. So we've seen the foundations destroyed. Uh, described. We've seen the foundations destroyed. Let's see the foundations defended. David gives the answer in verse 4 that the Lord is still in control. I read the verse. He states, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. God knows what's going on. We are commanded in Jude uh, Verse 3, Behold, uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it is needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We would probably have to hang our heads in shame if we looked back at our forefathers and what they endured for our freedoms today. 
Listen, I'm not saying riot. I'm not saying do anything that's, that's not biblical, that's not constitutional. But listen, my friends, we need to earnestly contend for the faith. There are people that are outright making no bones about it, making no apology that they are anti-God and anti-Bible. McGee said this. You know, I, I like to read McGee. And he's been gone for a long time. So this has been quite a few years ago. He said in his day, apostasy was just a little cloud the size of a man's hand in Jude's day. But now is a storm of hurricane force. The word contend has the idea of agony. Are we in agony about the things that are going on? We should be. We should earnestly contend for truth. And earnestly contend for the faith. Romans 16, 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. I've said many times, we must stand on truth. We must stand on what God says. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's getting more and more unpopular. But our command is to earnestly contend for the faith. And then the last thing, we need to live for the faith. 1 Corinthians 4, 2, very fam uh, famous, familiar verse. It says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So in the Lord, verse 1, I uh, put I my trust. In these days of uncertainty, that's where we need to put our trust. He doesn't want to flee as a bird to the mountain. And if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The righteous, in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let's remember that foundations are critically important. Everything else is built on that. The illustrations I gave, the houses that I've mentioned, the different things, the, the doctrine that we use to guide our everyday actions is built on a foundation, hopefully from truth. What foundations are we building upon? I'm thankful that we have a pastor that preaches the word of God faithfully, that this church has stood all of these years. And my prayer is that we will earnestly contend for the faith. And as we have v, uh, virtual VBS, as we get back to the youth on Wednesday, as we get back to, to uh, frontline clubs in the fall, as soon as we possibly can, listen, and use this technology. Listen, we need to reach the young people. It's never been more critical in any day in my lifetime. In my opinion, we need to earnestly contend. We need to build on these foundations. The answer to what the righteous can do if the foundations are destroyed is nothing. You can't build if there's no foundation. And if you do, it'll be like that foolish man that built it on the earth that when the flood came, it just didn't fall. What did it say? It was vehemently wiped away. This verse, verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? reminds us, commands us, it shows us the necessity of holding and preaching foundational truth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you've given us your word. We're thankful that whatever's happening around us, that your word is true. I think of the song, The Bible Stands. We know that your word stands, that your word will accomplish its person, purpose. I pray that you will help us to be faithful in these times. Lord, be with all of the different unrest that's going on in this country. We pray, Lord, for revival. We pray for men and women's hearts to be changed. We pray for our leaders that they will uh, do the right thing, that they will uh, be guided by you, that they will uh, keep in mind the, the founding principles of this country. Once again, we're thankful that we were uh, privileged to be born in America, to live here, to serve and Lord, we're thankful to be able to, as we saw from that song this morning, look to the cross for the freedom that ultimately you provide. Thankful for this time we've had tonight in your word. Pray that you'll bless us as we go our separate ways. Give us a good week. Thankful again for our pastor and, and continue to uh, help him to heal up. Give us a great night in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your hymnals once again and turn to hymn number 843. 843, as Dave so eloquently said, our foundation as Christians is Jesus Christ. Hopefully we as Christians can 
really mean what this song says. I'd rather have Jesus than anything the world affords. If our country would simply come back to that same principle, all the problems would be gone. Please join me, please stand and join me as we sing from our hearts, I'd rather have Jesus. We'll sing verses one and two. close in prayer, I just want to tell Dave thanks how much I appreciate him filling in today and leading the singing. Really appreciate that. He did a great job and uh, appreciate everybody uh, praying and pitching in. And let's uh, close the service in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we're thankful for all that you've done for us in Christ. We're thankful that, as was mentioned, uh, our true liberty comes in you. And we're thankful that you uh, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And we're thankful that we have that liberty in you. Please bless our country. Please bring revival. Please uh, be with our leaders and, and, and those in, in authority. Lord, pre protect our law enforcement and those that are out in harm's way every day, uh, the nurses, doctors, and others with, with the virus and everything else going on. Lord, I ask your blessing on them. We're thankful that we could meet tonight and hear your word. We're thankful for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <clears throat>